And of course, as debates over in-person learning continue, hospitalization rates for young people are climbing. Chicago's indoor vaccine policy for some businesses began this week as the city's daily case average reaches more than 4,500 cases. Joining us to discuss this and more is Dr. Allison Arwady, the commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. Dr. Arwady, we know that you're expected to be at that press conference with the mayor in about 20 minutes, so thank you for fitting us in. Um, as we mentioned, daily hospitalization rates uh, up to an average of about seven hospitalizations per day for children. Um, but put that in perspective for us, because while it is the highest during the pandemic, you still say it's very rare. Uh, it is, and really what we've done is compare even before vaccines were available, the rate, thank goodness, that we are seeing children hospitalized with COVID is very similar to the rate that we see children hospitalized with flu in a typical year. You add vaccination on top of that, most of the people, uh, the children who are being vaccinated, even while that number is low, are unvaccinated teenagers. I am not concerned about being in school uh, because school itself is not known. It doesn't increase the risk of COVID infection. In fact, it's been shown in multiple studies to decrease it because of the masks, because of the mitigations in place. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to make light of the fact that there are children being hospitalized, but only 15% of the kids in Chicago hospitals today have COVID-19. The other 85% have other illnesses uh, and we don't upend school, we don't stop for influenza and between children being unlikely to have severe outcomes, especially if they're vaccinated and staff, if they are vaccinated and especially if they're boosted, having an almost zero risk of being hospitalized or having severe illness, it really is concerning to me that we're pretending like it's February 2020, uh, you know, at the beginning of all this. And in the instance of the kids who are being hospitalized, what what is the cause of those hospitalizations? Do they do some of those children have um, uh, additional uh, complications in their health? Yeah, they do. Uh, and certainly, you know, as you know, there has been all along for children who have these severe underlying issues, they have been able to be remote. That's been important uh, from the beginning. So yes, if there are children who are getting treated for cancer, et cetera, a COVID infection is, is really dangerous uh, potentially for them. And that's what that hospitalization includes. We've not had during this Omicron surge, which has been big, we've not had a single vaccinated five to 11 year old uh, admitted to the hospital, at least through the end of December when we were looking at this and almost no vaccinated 12 to 17 year olds where we are seeing children admitted, it's unvaccinated 12 to 17 year olds, typically with underlying conditions, but again, not at rates higher than we see with influenza. Thank goodness. I wish COVID behaved in adults like it behaves in children. And vaccine is what makes it more likely to behave uh, it like like the flu. Um, so that's 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 really the bottom line. And at the same time, Dr. Arwady, of course, you know, all week, all day, we've been talking about how Chicago Public Schools parents are waiting to find out whether or not their students will be in the classroom tomorrow as the union and the district work out their differences. But with a 23.6% positivity rate across the city, you still believe that, that students are safe in their classrooms? I do. You know, this has been a question that has been asked actually and answered multiple times, including here in Chicago. New York City has a 35% positivity rate. Their schools are open. There's a sense out there that there isn't testing happening. There is testing happening in every CPS school this week. Uh, and frankly, testing is not the full answer here. I've, I've seen what CPS put forward. I agree with it. There certainly will be need for classrooms and potentially even schools to flip remote, just as we are seeing that our other schools are open here in Chicago right now. We are seeing them having some operational challenges, but we know that school is essential. And my question, like, are we just gonna keep doing this when what we've seen over and over again being in school is not a risk factor for staff or students to have an increased risk of COVID. In fact, it's been shown to be protective. So what are some of the factors, you know, Dr. Arbody, as you look at the numbers, cases, hospitalizations across the age groups, what are the factors that you're considering? For example, you've talked about, you know, more testing happening uh, because of the holiday break um, and people wanting to test before kids go back to school. Um, but at the same time, a lot of use of at home tests and those aren't necessarily getting reported uh, to your office the same way. 
That's right. Uh, and we have, this is, this is where the epidemiologists come in. Uh, if you think of this as equivalent, you know, like influenza, for years we have what we call surveillance for influenza. We don't count every single flu case, but we definitely count where people are getting seriously sick, hospitalized, ICUs, deaths. And then we sample from across emergency departments, from across hospitals, from across outpatient offices for flu to understand what are we seeing with surges? What are we seeing with strains? That's where we're going to be in a long-term way with COVID not counting every single case. But I want to be clear that we today broke the record for the number of people hospitalized with COVID-19 infection in the city of Chicago. That is deeply concerning to me. And the biggest, what is driving that surge are people who are still not vaccinated. The risk nine times greater of getting hospitalized right now with COVID-19 in Chicago in those who are unvaccinated compared to those who are uh, vaccinated and boosted and more than five times uh, higher uh, in unvaccinated compared to even those who haven't had their booster. So we got to get people vaccinated. That's how we protect our hospitals. And that's part of why uh, we've been encouraging, um, of, of course, you know, vaccination in all ways that we can, including this new uh, requirement for higher risk settings while we get through this surge. Okay. A record breaking day. I just wanted to reiterate what you what you just said there uh, for hospitalizations in Chicago. Um, the at home tests, though, I think a lot of us know now those are hard to come by these days and you've recommended Amazon as one location where people can find them. How do we know what's reputable? So as long as you're as, as long as it's it's a test that um, has the sign off from the FDA has that emergency use authorization. It is a reputable test. Uh, you can go to the FDA website if you want to see uh, the lists of which of those that are available. But things that you're seeing uh, on Amazon, for example, those are being vetted and checked. Uh, similarly, things that you would be seeing on uh, pharmacy websites, Walmart, etc. Um, I can't wait for there to be more availability of these. The feds have been working on this. Um, but in the meantime, even the health department, we've got orders for these rapid tests going back to November that have not been filled. Um, and it's part of why we're encouraging right now, any positive test, consider it to be a positive. Don't try to seek out additional testing. Um, and if you're having symptoms that could be COVID, chances are good that it is COVID. COVID until proven otherwise, isolate for at least five days, regardless of your vaccination status. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to increase testing accessibility and we're prioritizing schools and high risk settings as we do that. And once those tests, because they can be expensive, once those tests, you know, are much more widely available, that order that you've had since November gets filled, um, is the city considering or would the city consider distributing those tests widely in communities that have been harder hit? Oh, absolutely. We actually have distributed more than 150,000 of them before the supply drain, uh, drained up in the communities where we know it's harder for people to afford tests like that. We've used them in a lot of our higher risk settings, like for people experiencing homelessness. We've used them in uh, you know, some of the correctional facilities. We've distributed them as part of our case investigation and contact tracing. The goal is to make sure that people can access testing where it is most needed and where the risk is higher. Schools are actually not where the risk is higher, but we know the worry is higher uh, and I've been pleased to see really some of these new ways that uh, schools have been working to build that testing accessibility but testing is not the full answer it's the combination of the investments in ventilation uh, the distancing the symptom screening um, the uh, and then you know finally Masking, most hygiene. importantly vaccine exactly <laughs> absolutely um, and before we let you go doc I have to ask this press conference that you've got coming up with the mayor in about 10 minutes or so any sense of what we might hear from you uh, and the mayor then? Um, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see what comes there. I, I think, you know, all day I've been trying to share the science on why we feel very strongly that in-person education is the right decision. Uh, and uh, my expectation is that while people are voting, um, we'll want to continue to explain the science behind that, explain operationally what is in place, uh, and and to potentially talk contingency planning, uh, just given um, that I know a lot of parents are wondering uh, what is going to happen tomorrow. Okay, uh, a, lot to, a lot to consider there. Dr. Allison Arbody, we'll let you go. Thanks so much for joining us as always. Thank you.